Hi everybody, my name is Zach and welcome to Camp TV. Are you ready for some summer fun? Me too! <laughs> now as your head counselor, I will be introducing you to all sorts of cool activities. Arts, crafts, games, math, and science, as well as some of my favorite books, nature, and theater. I will be here to take you from one activity to the next. So follow me on Camp TV. This program was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Additional funding was provided by Joan Gans Cooney. Trixie. Zach is my human. He likes to call me Moo Moo. I don't get it, but love is love. I will be your head camp Katzler, and I will introduce you to all sorts of cool activities and some of my BFFs, best furry friends. So let's let the fur fly because today is Pets Day on Camp TV. Did you hear something? Hmm, guess not. Jump, dance, play. It's time to get active. Let's move. Sharp, and I am a teaching artist at the New Victory Theater. I am sitting here in my Brooklyn apartment with my two fellow clowns. One is named Maywin, and the other one is named Pia. <laughs> this is Maywin and Pia, and the cats running through. Just like your house, we have a lot of creatures living here. I am a performing artist and a clown, and today we are going to teach you how to do a very simple clown routine. And it's Easy. Sometimes we have to get silly in our house, so this is a good way to sort of practice that. And once you know it, you can teach it to your grown-ups, too. Are you ready to begin? Are you ready to begin? Yeah. Are you ready to begin? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm so ready. I am, too. Now, it may seem difficult to clown, but the truth is I think lots of people are doing it all the time when we're silly. And one thing you need to know about being a clown and clowning is that you have to share your feelings with the audience. So. If I were having a feeling about something, I wouldn't just share it with my friend and me, but I would also share it with my audience right here. So we're going to learn how to do a simple clown routine with just a few steps. So we're going to imagine that we're walking through a meadow. Could we stand up? Let's walk. We're walking through a meadow, a beautiful meadow. Isn't it lovely? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to spot just ahead of us a tiny and beautiful flower. I see it there in front of me. Do you see yours? Do you see yours? And instead of just focusing on that beautiful flower, I'm going to share how I feel with the audience. So look at your flower and then check in or chicken <laughs> to the audience. So everybody chicken to the audience and back to your flower. And you're going to decide, I want to pick that flower up. I want to pick it. And then you're going to chicken to the audience again. Check to your flower, bend over, and pick it. Bring it up to your face. Check into the audience and share how you feel. Are you excited about this flower? Very Are you a little bit sorry that you picked it? Maybe you shouldn't have picked it? Gary has feelings about his flower. And now you're going to decide, I think we're going to smell it. So decide that. Check into the audience. I want to smell it. And take a deep breath in. Now here, you might decide that you are going to love the smell. Let's see Pia love the smell of her flower. And then share it with the audience by chickening. Good. 
And let's see Pia, I'm sorry, Maywin, let's see you. Smell your flower and I think it's the yuckiest thing that you've ever smelled. Ugh, and share it with the audience, chicken to the audience. Pretty good. Now I'm gonna to decide to do something different. Let's see if you can guess what I choose. I'm gonna smell it really deeply. something different. Pia really enjoyed that smell of that beautiful flower. Maywin did not love it and I thought it was delicious and I had to eat it. So you have a choice to make. You get to choose your own adventure. So let's start at the beginning. Let's see it all three together. Back down to our seats and we decide silently that we're gonna go on a little adventure walking through the meadow. Shall we go? <laughs> choice before you smell it. How are you going to feel? Deep breath in. And get out of the seat. Wow, which did you choose? I chose a snake. I saw you and I heard you sneeze. What did you choose, Pia? Eat. You chose to eat the flower. Maybe it was a beautiful herb that was edible and delicious. I chose to enjoy it so much and it made me feel so happy. And then I decided to use it to decorate my hair. So we have three different choices. And the reason why we're able to share those feelings is because we're chicking, chicking in, chickening in with the audience, right? So now that we know the very simple cloud routine, walking through our meadow, Chicken. See the flower? Chicken. Pick the flower? Chicken. Smell the flower? Chicken. And have whatever it is and reaction that you want. Chicken. Wait, we got it down, right? Now, once you have this simple routine down, you can play with it a lot of different ways. You can also add some things to it if you like. And make your own. Mm -hmm. If you want, you can also add some cute things to put on if you want to play it at home. Like I got these glasses from this Anna and Elsa bracelet. And I'm gonna put it on to see how it looks and we can all do it together. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Whoa. Welcome back. Wasn't that last segment awesome? <laughs> So today is Pets Day on Camp TV. And if you don't have one, a pet, that is, do not worry. You can borrow mine. I forewarn you though, Trixie does a lot of sleeping on the job. <laughs> kind of reminds me of my first pet rock, Petey. But at least Trixie's in good company. Seems a couple of her friends are master nappers too. Check out Monty, for example. Must have had a rough, rough night. Get it? Rough, rough! <laughs> and on the opposite end of the spectrum, Thomas, Saki, Pebbles, and Annie Oakley and his human, Ollie. And this guy, Henry. I have no idea what he's doing, but I like it. But Trixie's best friend, Izzy. Izzy expects to be treated like royalty by her human Cleo. Something Trixie can really relate to. C 
see you after your next few activities. Curiosity and wonder. Let's discover together. It's science wow. <laughs> what is the role of a chicken on a farm? And how is a chicken connected to the rest of the living things around us? Our chickens help us on the farm by providing eggs, meat, and companionship. Let's check out the nesting boxes in this coop. Chickens will get cozy in the nesting box to lay their eggs. This is a good place for them to brood and care for them. Look what we see here. Eggs, still very warm. Let's check and see if there are any here. If she's laid any, to oh, there we see. She's laying on two eggs, keeping them warm. What is inside the egg anyway? For this investigation, you'll need a chicken egg, it can be brown or white. You'll need a bowl. You'll need a paper towel or a second bowl. And then optional is a toothpick and a magnifying lens. Let's take a close look at an egg. You can see with your eyes the bumpy, grainy texture of the outer shell. If you have a magnifying lens, you may be able to see tiny holes or pores in the shell. Our first step is to carefully tap the egg's hard shell against a table to crack the egg gently. We're gonna use our fingers to slowly, carefully remove the shell piece by piece and see how far we can get before the membrane tears. When the membrane does tear, which it will, we're gonna gently allow the egg contents to go into our bowl, trying our best not to break the yolk. Here we can see the outer shell and we can see the membrane. The membrane is a very thin, but very flexible and strong coating just inside the egg. It's much like our skin, made of keratin. If you look in the bottom of the larger end of the egg, you may see what we call the air cell. It's a bubble with air. It's formed at the time the egg is laid. You can press your finger gently and feel the bubble. Now let's look at the bowl with the yolk and the albumin. Try to find a division between the thin, clear albumin and the thick albumin. Albumin is 90% water and 10% protein. How can you tell the difference between the thick and the thin albumin? What does it look like? How is the color or the consistency different? Next, we're going to look at something called the chelate. Those are two twisted white strands. They're either running underneath the yolk or extending out at either end of the yolk. See if you might be able to separate them, but you can at least see they're actually made of protein, twisted strands, and they help keep the yolk suspended between the two eggs. The yolk would have been food for the baby chick. If you look closely, you may see a white dot on the surface of the yolk. This is known as the germinal disc. Take your toothpick very gently, poke the yolk without breaking it, and you will feel another membrane. This membrane is called the vitellin membrane. It's a clear casing that keeps the yolk all contained. The yolk itself has protein, fat, vitamins, and minerals. All right, your last step is to pick up your bowl, rest it just above your second bowl, and pour your egg into your hand. Now you're going to pour your egg back and forth and let the albumin go through your fingers or between your hands. And keep the yolk in the palms of your hand. Now let the yolk roll back and forth between your palms. What does that feel like? What does it remind you of? Eventually, that vitellin membrane would become dry and would break, 
and then the yoke breaks. Congratulations. You've just completed your egg dissection. It's time to clean up your area. Make sure you dispose of your egg specimen and the paper into the trash can. Clean your bowls, especially wash down your table and your counters. And then wash your hands thoroughly with warm, soapy water for 20 seconds or more. So let's think about what we experienced today. Are the eggs we have fragile or strong? What do you think? What about the other living things on the farm? How are chickens connected to them? We already watched our chickens eating some of our insects and plants. Chickens also provide manure, a fancy way to say poop. This poop can be put in a compost pile and after it's sat for a while, we can use it in our garden to provide food for our plants. Here on the farm, we call this the nutrient cycle, when matter and energy are transferred and exchanged between different living things. Energy from the sun is used by our plants to make their own food. Our animals, including our goats, our chickens, and our decomposers, the worms, eat plants to stay alive. In turn, our animals provide food in the form of manure to feed our plants. Thanks so much for joining us at MSU Tollgate Farm. Curiosity and wonder. Let's discover together. It's science wow. Well, hello. My name is Fox, and I am a science interpreter at the Franklin Institute. And today, we're going to be making some noise. Now, to make some noise, first, we need something very important. What are we breathing right now? Air. We need air for sound. So, to start off, we're going to need this tube, a glove, some tape, and a straw. Now, when we talk about sound, we're talking about the vibrations of the little tiny things that make up the air all around us. See that molecule right there? Neither can I. It's really, 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 really small. But if you have a bunch of those molecules bumping into each other and vibrating, from my mouth all the way to your ears, you get that sound. So what we're gonna do is create this thing called a glovophone, which causes the air inside the tube to vibrate. So first, take your tube and the glove, and you tape the glove around the edge of the tube, just like this. Now that you have your glove taped around your tube, Cut off the pinky finger, very, very close to the end, just like this. Remember, ask a parent or guardian to help you with the scissors. Next, take a straw. Paper is a good straw. You're going to insert that into the end of the glove, just like that. Use some tape. You fasten the straw inside of the glove. Let's use a little bit more, because you want to make sure this does not fall apart. Perfect. And now, blow into the straw. Oh, we forgot the most important part. If you want to make sound, we have to cause that air to vibrate. You need to pull the glove tight against the top of the tube. By doing this, we're causing that glove to vibrate and create that sound. Now, that's using a very small tube, but you can try to make a much larger one. It doesn't have to be paper either. You could go for plastic as well. So if we try it with a plastic tube, Notice what happens if you make a longer one. And we can even use a balloon in place of the glove. So feel free to make these glovophones to irritate your friends and family and make your own musical instrument. You took the words right out of my mouth. 
right on. Hi everyone, welcome to Story Pirates. Today we're going to be talking about how to practice showing, not telling, emotions or feelings. One amazing way to really show how a character is feeling is through dialogue, basically what the character is saying. For example, Eric is happy. Let's see what that would look like. I am happy. Oh no, I forgot to show, not tell. He just said, I am happy. No one who was actually really happy in real life would just say, I am happy. Okay, we can do better. Let's decide what dialogue Eric would say if he was really, truly, incredibly happy. Wow, I just pet two dogs. This is the best day of my life. That is so much better. It really shows why Eric is happy and it makes the story so much more interesting. Okay, let's do another one. Eric is terrified. Let's see what that would look like. I am terrified. I did it again. I forgot to show, not tell. I just said he was terrified. No one who was actually terrified in real life would just say, I am terrified. We can do better. Let's try again by adding some more dialogue. Um, who let all these snakes out? This isn't okay. Yes, that was so much better. Now there's a reason he was terrified. Let's do one more. Eric is confused. Let's see what this one looks like. I am confused. Oh no, you know, I did it again. No one would just say, I am confused. We can make this better. Let's add some dialogue. All right, this way is north. And no, this way is north. It's the, the, but there are four norths? Yes, that was the best. There's a reason he was confused. I'm feeling triumphant. I shouldn't just tell you, I should show you. I'm the best, I'm the best. I showed, I didn't tell. I'm feeling triumphant. I'm the best, I'm the best. Hi again. I want you to know that we are an equal opportunity, all pet loving family, and they come in all shapes, sizes, and species. Some are trendsetters, others quite intellectual. Case in point, Monty. Monty loves books, mostly for reading, sometimes for chewing. And speaking of chewing, check out Hammy. Someone's gotta tell this little guy to slow down. And who can forget our friend Skywalker? You know, I've been asking for the name of his hairstylist for years now. Somehow he keeps forgetting. And finally, there's our friend Strawberry. She loves going to art museums, never misses an exhibit. And you should never miss an activity. So I'll see you back here in a few. Music, dance, magic, and more. Step right up to center stage. Welcome everyone. My name is Yvonne Before and I'm from Lincoln Center and I'm so excited to be dancing with you all today. So for today's activity, we're going to be doing some West African dance and also exploring a choreographic device called Levels. So for this activity, what you'll need, some safe, yourself, and then you also might want to grab a piece of fabric or a scarf to tie around your waist so that you can have a lapa. A lapa is traditionally worn when performing West African dance. All right, so today we're going to be talking about levels. Okay, what are levels? There are three levels. We're going to talk about them today. High, middle, and then low. Okay, so any movements you do way up in the air, in case that you're jumping or flipping, those would be classified as high level movements. Anything you do in the middle, where it's like your knees are bent, okay, and you're in this middle space, this would be a middle level movement. And then anything you do that's like low on the ground, that's what we call a low level movement, okay? So we're gonna be using West African dance to explore these different levels and how we can use them as dancers and as choreographers. 
Now, are we doing this African movement? You want to make sure that you're using your full body, so you're using your head, your arms, your legs. Also, you really want to make sure that you're dancing from your core, which is your tummy. So all your movement comes from here. You want to make sure that you're also using that thing back there, your back. Okay, make sure you're using your back, so make sure you're ready to wiggle and roll and do all the cool things you need to do so you can make your movements big. Okay, I want nice big movements, all right? So, let's learn some of African movements and jump right into it. The first step that we're going to learn today is a diagonal side step, okay? So, you want to make sure your knees are bent, okay? You also have your upper body leaning a little bit forward, so you're kind of looking almost down to the ground in front of you, about two feet in front of you, okay? Your arms are going to go out and then in as you switch diagonals, okay? So they go out and then in, out and then in, out and then in, out and then in, okay? While your knees are bent, your feet are also going to be step, stepping together, okay? So you step, touch, you step, you touch. So together, this is what that looks like. Make sure your knees are bent, lean forward. You can also use your head to help you as you look the direction that you're stepping. Okay, here we go, five, six, Seven, and it goes out and together, out then together, out then together, out then together. All right, you got it? That's step one, okay? Now we're gonna move on to step number two. Step number two is going to be like a pushing motion, okay, as the arms are going, alternating going up and going down, all right? So it will start off with your hands pushing two times on each side. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, okay? Palms are facing up towards the sky, and your head is also tracking the hands as you're watching which way you're pushing, okay? So your feet are going to the same similar step as the first one, the diagonal step, okay? But instead of stepping out really far, you're going to kind of stay in place underneath yourself and just tap your foot, okay? So you tap, step, tap, step, tap, step, tap, step. Got it? Let's see if we can put that with the arms. We're going to do four pushes up and then we'll do four pushes down, okay? Here we go, five, six, seven, and we go up. Make sure you're tapping with your feet, and then we go down, push down. Leaning forward as much as you can, got it? All right, that's our second step. Now time for our third step, our third step, okay? Now, the arms are gonna swing out and in like this. They're gonna swing out, then you cross them, 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 okay? It's okay, it doesn't really matter which hand crosses in front, you can switch it up or keep it the same, okay? All that matters is you're crossing your arms as you bring them in, all right? So the arms are gonna go out and then cross, and as I'm doing that, the feet, your foot is just gonna step out, then back in, other foot out, then back in. So, now let's see if we can try it together. Putting the arms and the feet together, here we go, five, six, Seven, it goes out, then in, nice, out, then in. You also make sure that you turn your head and you look at your hands, okay? So the whole body is moving together, okay? So that is step three. All right, here we go. Starting with the first step, okay? Our side diagonal step. Then it goes to our second step where we're pushing up and then down. Then it goes to our third step where we're going out and in, keeping the body in the center as we go to the right and to the left, okay? So let's try it out together. Five, six, five, six, seven, and we go out, and two, you got it. Three, then four, now we push it up, up, and three, and four, then you push it down, down, and, and three, then we take it out and then out, then in, that's one. Make sure you're also using your head. There you go. And four. Nice, good job, guys. All right, are you ready to talk about levels now? So we have the first step. First, what level do you think this movement is in? Notice that my knees are bent. I'm leaning a little bit forward to the ground. If you said middle level, you're certainly right. That is a middle level movement, okay? So we're already in the middle level here. What would happen if we take it to a high level? How could this movement look different? How could it also still stay the same? I might add a jump in there and do a move that we call in West African dance called a rocking horse, okay? And it's called a rocking horse because it kind of looks like your body is rocking back and forth as you jump. So if I was gonna take this side diagonal step movement to a high level, it would look like this, and I'm gonna do the rocking horse, okay? So you would rock, 
and then you switch. Okay? The arms are still going out and in, but instead of going diagonal, you're just kind of staying straight as you jump facing one side, then you switch to the other side. Got it? Makes sense? All right, let's get to the second movement. So we're already pushing up here. Would you guys say this is a high, middle, or low? And then it switches to go down here. So for this one, I would more so classify it as a high level because my body is straight. I'm not necessarily bending my knees and bending down. And my arms are also pushing up into the air. So we can say the first half of this movement is a high level movement. And then when we switch to go down here and push down, this could be a low level movement. Okay, because you're really trying to get as low to the ground as you can get. So, hmm, the only thing that's missing is a mid level movement for this one. So let's try it. Instead of pushing up or pushing down, maybe we can just stay right here and push in the middle, still tapping the feet, alternating the feet. And there you go. We're going to pick one choice for our phrase today, okay? One variation. And then we're going to try it all together. So we have our first step our side diagonal step. I think we're going to keep that one the same, okay? And then for our second step, instead of pushing up and then down, maybe we'll push in the middle first and then push up only two times and then down two times, okay? Then our third step we have going out and in, keeping the body centered. Maybe we'll start off in the middle level, then go low. Oh no, I only said one choice, right? Okay, only one choice for now. Here we go. We're going to take it from the top. The first movement, our side diagonal step. Our second movement will start in the middle and then go up and then go down. And then we'll end with our arms swinging in and out in the middle level. Okay, here we go. Five, six, five, six, seven. And we go out and then in. You got it. Now we push it out in the middle. Two, three, four. Then we push it up. Then we push it down, and then we go out and in. You got it. Give me two more. Make sure you move your head. All right. You guys want to try it one more time? I think this time we need some music. Here we go. Five, six, five, six, seven, and in. You got it. Now we push it out, push it out. Now we push it up, then down. Then we stay in the middle. You got it. Good job. All right, one more time. And this time, let's see if we can speed this first move up a little bit. So instead of doing four slow ones, we'll do like eight fast ones. We're gonna try it a little bit faster now. Five, six, five, six, seven, and. That's four, give me four more. Now push it up. Now push it up. Now down. Now out in the middle. You got it. Three, four. Yes, you did it. Thank you for joining me today. Once again, my name is Yvonne Winborn from Lincoln Center. And I really hope that you all have fun doing some West African dance moves with me today as we explore the choreographic device all levels. Okay, remember to keep dancing, keep exploring. See you next time. A little birdie told me it's time to go wild. Hi everyone, my name is Aliana and I'm an animal interpreter here at the Memphis Zoo. Today we're gonna to be learning all about snakes with my friend, Monty the ball python. We're going to learn what ball pythons like to do when they live out in the wild, why they're important to the places that they live, and how you can help ball pythons from your own home. Ball pythons are a type of snake found in Western Africa, and they're arboreal. That means that they spend most of their time up in the trees, climbing around on branches. Monty's doing an excellent demonstration of how they're able to hold on tight to those branches with all of those muscles that they have all along their body. It might be kind of hard to imagine, but they have muscles just like we do, and they hold on to branches kind of like how you might hold on to monkey bars with the muscles in your hands and arms if you were climbing on them and didn't want to fall. Ball pythons use those muscles we were talking about when they're climbing, and they also use them to help get their food. Ball pythons are a type of constrictor, which means that when they find their favorite food, a rat or a mouse, they're going to grab it with their mouth and then squeeze it very tightly before they eat it. 
The food that ball pythons and other snakes all over the world love to eat are the reason that they're so important in the places that they live and so helpful to us humans. Mice and rats can have large populations or lots and lots of them all in one place. Having snakes around helps keep mice and rats from completely taking over areas and spreading the diseases that they might carry. One cool adaptation or special skill that snakes have is the ability to eat things that are bigger than their head. Humans can't do that because our bottom jaw, the part that holds our bottom teeth and makes our chin, is hard bone that's completely connected and can't stretch. On snakes, their bottom jaw isn't connected by bone, so they can stretch it out sideways to fit a tasty rat inside. So, we know now that ball pythons are really important to the place that they live because they help keep the number of rats and mice controlled. Because of that, we want ball python populations to stay healthy and not get too low. The first question that we get a lot is, why are they called ball pythons? And the reason that they have that name is their defense system, which means what they do when they get scared. So ball pythons, if they were to get startled by something, maybe somebody like a human who's a lot bigger than them, they are gonna curl into a tight little ball. Just like other snakes that we might see here in the United States, ball pythons are a lot more scared of humans than humans are of them. So what they're going to do is hide themselves so that they can avoid conflict and be able to go along safely. The next question we get asked about pretty much every snake we talk about is, is she venomous or poisonous? And the answer is neither. She's not venomous, that would mean that when she bit something like a mouse or a rat, she would be able to inject venom into it through her teeth, and that's not the case. She's also not poisonous. That would mean that if a larger animal, one of her predators, were to come along and try to eat her, it would get sick after eating her, and that's also not the case. Another very common question is, does she bite? And we like to say that anything with a mouth can bite. So when she's out hunting for prey, it's true, she does bite down on that rat to be able to catch it. But snakes are only going to bite things other than what they're eating if they are scared. So if you are out in the wild in the United States, you're not gonna find ball pythons there, but you might see another kind of snake. And regardless of if it's venomous or not, the best thing to do is just take two big steps back and give it lots and lots of space so that it doesn't get scared and potentially try to defend itself. Again, they're a lot more afraid of us than we are of them. People also like to know if she's full grown, and the answer is yes, she is full grown. Ball pythons definitely aren't the longest species of snake that there is, but they still need lots of room to be able to climb and stretch out. People also like to know how long they can live and how old Monty is. We're not sure exactly how old Monty is, but she has been here at the Memphis Zoo since 1993. That is about 27 years. And when ball pythons are kept by humans, like in the zoo here where we take excellent care of her, it is very common for them to live into their 30s. A lot of times people want to know if she's slimy, and the answer is no, she's not. Their scales sometimes reflect light, so they sort of might look like they're wet, but their scales are made of the same thing that our fingernails are made out of, something called keratin. So if you feel your fingernails, that is what Monty's scales feel like. Since ball pythons are reptiles, people like to know if they lay eggs, and the answer is yes. When female ball pythons lay eggs, they'll lay between four and 10. When the hatchlings or baby snakes come out of the eggs, they are about nine inches long usually. But then throughout their lives, as we can see with Monty here, they grow a lot bigger. So today with the help of Monty, we learned all about snakes. We learned how they love to climb and stretch out and hold on with their muscles. We learned that they can stretch their bottom jaw sideways to be able to eat mice and rats that are bigger than their head and we learned the important job that they do out in the wild. Ball pythons and snakes all over the world help provide us an excellent service by controlling the number of mice and rats around that might spread disease. So we are very grateful for all of our snakes that are around doing that super important job. I'd like to give a big thank you from me, Monty, and all of us here at the Memphis Zoo. Bye everyone. Um, help? This is harder than it looks, especially without thumbs. Almost. Whoops. Can you see me? Can you see me out? No one told me I was going to have to pull off a Trixie challenge. challenge. I think it's time to call it quits anyway. I need a nap. It's been at least four minutes since my last one. Until the next pet's day, stay happy campers. Bye-bye. Okay, no, seriously this time. Did you hear something? Daytime or nighttime?
It's always time for story time. Hi, my friends. My name is Amaris, and I'm going to be your special reader today. And today's story, I'm reading to you from my home here in Brooklyn. Have you been to Brooklyn before, or do you live in Brooklyn? Can you believe I've been in Brooklyn my whole life since I was a little baby? Yeah, I really love it here. One of the things that makes Brooklyn so special is that it has a very large park named Prospect Park. And in that park, there is a forest area with many, many trees and many little animals. Mm -hmm. Many times we call the forest the woods. And today, the story I'm going to read to you takes place in the woods. Are you ready to see which story it is? Let's get a drum roll. Ready? Today's story is called The Gruffalo. Do you know this book? Have you heard it before? Some friends have and some friends haven't. Today, we're all going to read it together. And this book is by one of my very favorite authors named Julia Donaldson. And the illustrator's name is Axel Scheffler. In this story, we're going to hear from a little mouse who is very clever. Clever means that you're using your brain to think in a very quick and a very smart way. And this mouse is very clever because he tells all the other forest animals things so that they will not have him for a snack. So we're going to listen in to all the ways the little mouse is going to be clever. And let's start our read. The Gruffalo. The Gruffalo. There's the forest we talked about. We're going to call it the deep, dark wood. Can you say that with me? The deep, dark wood. That's right. Let's see what happens in the deep, dark wood. The Gruffalo. I'm going to start to read the story right here where the words begin. A mouse took a stroll through the deep dark wood. A fox saw the mouse and the mouse looked good. Come have lunch in my underground house. It's terribly kind of you, fox, but no, I'm gonna have lunch with the Gruffalo. A Gruffalo? What's a Gruffalo? A Gruffalo, why didn't you know? Oh, I wonder what a Gruffalo is. What do you guys think? I'm gonna have to see. Let's listen. He has terrible tusks. That means long teeth. And terrible claws. Show me your claws. That means long nails. And terrible teeth. And his terrible jaws. This is our jaw. Can you touch your jaw? Our jaw has a hinge. It helps our mouth to open and close. Where are you meeting him? Here by these rocks. And his favorite food is roasted fox. Roasted fox? Oh my, fox said. Goodbye, little mouse. And away he sped. Silly old fox, doesn't he know? There's no such thing as a gruffalo. Let's see who the little mouse will see next. On went the mouse through the deep dark wood. An owl saw the mouse and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Join me for tea in my treetop house. Way up here in the trees. It's frightfully nice of you, Owl. But no, 
I'm going to have tea with the Gruffalo. All right, let's read this part together. It's a pattern, the same words that we read before. Ready? A Gruffalo? What's a Gruffalo? A Gruffalo? Why didn't you know? He has knobbly knees and turned out toes and a poisonous wart at the end of his nose. Where are you meeting him? Here by the stream. And his favorite food is owl ice cream. Owl ice cream. Too witch, too woo. Goodbye, little mouse. And away he flew. Silly old owl. Doesn't he know? There's no such thing as a gruffalo. Why do you think the owl flew away in a scurry? Why did that happen? The mouse was being clever. Let's hear about what happens next. Who's that? On went the mouse through the deep dark wood. A snake saw the mouse and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come for a feast in my log pile house. It's wonderfully good of you, snake, but no. I'm having a feast with a gruffalo. All right, ready? Let's read together. A gruffalo? What's a gruffalo? A gruffalo, why didn't you know? Let's see. We're hearing more about how this Gruffalo looks. His eyes are orange. His tongue is black. He has purple prickles all down his back. Where are you meeting him? Here by this lake. And his favorite food is scrambled snake. Scrambled snake, it's time I hid. Goodbye, little mouse, and away snake slid. Can you do that with me? Nice. Silly old snake, doesn't he know? There's no such thing as a gruffle. Oh, but who is this creature with terrible claws? and terrible teeth in his terrible jaws. He has knobbly knees and turned out toes and a poisonous wart at the end of his nose. His eyes are orange, his tongue is black. He has purple prickles all down his back. Oh help, oh no, it's a gruffalo. Why do you think Mouse was so surprised? What was Mouse thinking? He didn't know the Gruffalo was real. Let's see what happens next. I wonder if the, the Mouse is going to continue being clever. What do you think? Let's read and see. My favorite food, the Gruffalo said. You'll taste good on a slice of bread. Good, said the mouse. Don't call me good. I'm the scariest creature in this deep dark wood. 
Just walk behind me and you'll see all those animals are afraid of me. Oh, sure, said the Gruffalo, bursting with laughter. <laughs> you lead the way and I'll follow after. They walked and walked till the Gruffalo said, I hear a hiss in the grass ahead. Let's see. Who might be hissing in the grass? Which animals hiss? It's Snake, said the mouse. Why, Snake, hello. Snake took one look at the Gruffalo. Oh, dear, he said. Goodbye, little mouse, and slid right into his log pile house. Why did Snake leave so quickly? Do you think Snake was worried about Mouse? Or was Snake worried about the Gruffalo? You see, said Mouse, I told you so. Amazing, said the Gruffalo. They walked some more till the Gruffalo said, I hear a hoot in the trees ahead. Hmm, who is hooting? Which animal hoots? It's Owl, said the mouse. Why, Owl, hello. Owl took one look at the Gruffalo. Boo-hoo, he said. Goodbye, little mouse, and flew right up to his treetop house. You see, said Mouse, I told you so. Astounding said the Gruffalo. They walked some more till the Gruffalo said, I hear some paws in the path ahead. Hmm. Let's see who's next. Ix Fox, said the mouse. Why, Fox, hello. Fox took one look at the Gruffalo. Oh, help, he said. Goodbye, little mouse, and ran right into his underground house. The mouse said, Gruffalo, now you see, everyone is afraid of me, but now my tummy is starting to rumble. And my favorite food is, can you guess what the mouse said about his favorite food? The mouse said his favorite food is, Gruffalo crumble. Gruffalo crumble. The Gruffalo said, and as quick as the wind, he turned and he fled. That means to run away really fast. Why do you think the Gruffalo ran away so quickly? The Gruffalo thought that the mouse was going to eat him. And the Gruffalo thought that all the other animals were worried about that mouse. So he ran away. He did not want to be the mouse's snack. Mm -mm. And now the story says, all was quiet in the deep, dark wood. The mouse found a nut, and the nut was good. And now the forest is still, and the forest is quiet. And my friends, that is the end. Thank you so much for reading this book with me. If you like the words of this book, put one thumb up. If you like the pictures of this book, put another thumb up. And if you like the words and pictures, put your thumbs high in the sky and make them fly. Thank you so much. It was great to read to you today.
together. It's a place for you and me. It's Camp TV. This program was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Additional funding was provided by Joan Gans Cooney. Content provided by these institutions.